Hello students, welcome to The Analyst, dated 12th of September 2023. Today, we'll look at five important articles from the Indian Express and the Hindu. The first article will be India-Saudi bilateral relationship. Then, we'll look at lateral entry. Then, we'll come to aspirational district program. Finally, we'll look at TRAI, the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, and why the Nifty touched 20,000 psychological benchmarks. Now, let's start with the first article. So, launch of West Asia Economic Corridor is a historic step. That is what the Prime Minister said. Now, before we go into the India-Saudi bilateral relationship, we must look at the backdrop. Backdrop of G20. Because the India-Saudi relationship came in news because post G20, there was a bilateral meeting. So the crown prince, he stayed back for a day. Now, what is the backdrop? So we are looking at a pandemic. Then a shrugged recovery. A slow recovery. Then inflation in food and in fuel. So these are global issues. Then we were looking at Russia-Ukraine crisis. Then we were looking at energy wars. Then we were looking at the G20 in Bali, which essentially accused Russia for the Russia-Ukraine war. So this was the backdrop in which all these discussions of G20 were held on 9th and 10th of September. But what was the outcome that India got? So India tried to steer away from all these contentious issues and it got the New Delhi Declaration. Simultaneously, it launched the India, West Asia, Europe Economic Corridor. And so this is an alternate model to the Belt and Road Initiative that we discussed. So it is not only steering away from the nexus of China, which it is trying to build with Russia, but also to simultaneously look at the global south and foster more cooperation not only from the South, but also from the West Asian region. And Saudi Arabia, given that it is the de facto head of West Asia, it becomes extremely pertinent to understand the India-Saudi relationship. Now, let's look at the background. So, India and Saudi Arabia enjoy a cordial and friendly relation reflecting the centuries and old economic socio-cultural ties. So this can serve as a good introduction whenever you write an answer on West Asia or Saudi Arabia. Now, so in 2010, under Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, we got the Riyadh Declaration and India and Saudi Arabia, they became a strategic partner. So a strategic partnership agreement was agreed upon. Now, in 2016, our Prime Minister, Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji was given the highest civilian order. Then in 2019, again, the Crown Prince, he gave the assurance of $100 billion of investment in various sectors. Then in 2019 only, Prime Minister again visited Saudi Arabia and a strategic partnership council was created. So this is naturally a progression, an improvement of the Riyadh declaration. Now let's look at the economics of it. Given that India-Saudi relationship primarily surrounded by oil and gas, then diaspora, and the third new parameter of security architecture. So earlier it used to be a simple buyer-seller relationship where we were the buyers importers of oil and gas and they were the sellers. And we must appreciate that Saudi Arabia is also the head of the cartel called OPEC. And it is a key partner of OPEC plus where Russia and Saudi Arabia they operate in cohorts. 
Now, so let's look at the trade. So trade stands at 50 billion dollar and Saudi is India's second largest trading partner with Indian exports going to 10 billion dollar. Now this looks very small but we must also appreciate that Saudi is one of the biggest source for our oil and gas. And let's look at the energy partnership. So it is the third largest crude and petroleum product is sourced from Saudi Arabia and it accounts for 16% of our crude oils and around 11% of our LPG imports. So this tells us that energy and thereby our energy security is hinged to Saudi Arabia as well as to peace in the Middle East or West Asia. So we cannot take sides in the West Asian region. We cannot choose sides and we have to hedge our relationships and we have to diversify our imports as well as diversify our energy usage so as to have a sustainable energy transition, a sustainable and healthy energy mix as well as have a sustainable energy basket which we import. Now looking at investments, so these are meager $2 billion from the Indian side and Saudi Arabia amounting to $3 billion. Now that is why the promise for a hundred billion dollars in terms of investment in Indian sectors. Now, what can we tap out of this? So, if you look at Saudi Arabia, the potential is huge given that it is a crude dependent nation which wants to diversify. And if it wants to diversify, it will use its sovereign wealth funds, its reserves, and these reserves can be tapped into various sectors of the Indian economy. Let's say ports, let's say airports, let's say some capital intensive sectors like transmissions, right? So infrastructure oriented long term gestation funds can be generated from Saudi Arabia. Given that we have a healthy trade relationship as well as a healthy importer exporter relationship when it comes to energy. Now, let's look at the diaspora. So, 2.2 million that is. 2.22 lakh people of Indian origin, which is roughly 7% of the population of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And that is crucial, not only in terms of numbers, but also in terms of the skill sets. And parallelly, the businesses that are now being run by Indians in these regions. Now, anyone who is, let's say, migrating towards Saudi Arabia, they would first work, they will get skilled. And finally, they also contribute to the economy by paying taxes as well as by going for new businesses. So migration and smooth migration is a key issue. And therefore, the India e-migrate system has been integrated with the e tawthik system. Then the annual hedge pilgrimage has been increased to 2 lakh. So 2 lakh people yearly can go for the hajj pilgrimage. Now let's look at the India Saudi Arabia Strategic Partnership Council. Now why do you need such a council? Because all the decisions cannot be taken by the Prime Minister and let's say the Crown Prince. And that is what we have seen in the G20, where majority of the work was done by the Sherpas. So we need people to first collaborate on multiple issues, discuss debate very freely. And finally, at the decision making stage, we involve the top leaders or we have the summit level that is Prime Minister and Crown Prince. Now, <clears throat> it is aimed to establish a high level council and to steer the Indian Indo-Saudi relationship. Now there are two committees here, Committee on Political, Security, Social and Cultural Cooperation and Committee on Economics and Investment. Then there are four functional levels. First is the summit level where the Prime Minister and the Crown Prince, they will meet. Then ministerial level, let's say we are going for energy sector. So the ministers of both Saudi Arabia, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia as well as Republic of India. Then a senior work officials meeting and a joint working group on any particular project. So these are the four functional level at which the India Saudi Arabia Strategic Partnership Council can operate. Now let's look at the key outcomes. 
So the biggest takeaway was the India Middle East Europe Economic Corridor. Then to expedite the implementation of 50 billion dollar West Coast refinery project. Now here we must look at the aspect of energy security. So India wants to go to net zero by 2070. That means India is agreeing that oil and gas will be key to its energy requirements. Simultaneously what we are saying in the Panchamrita goals that more than 50% of our energy needs will come from non-renewable energy. That tells us what? That till 2070 at least we will need oil and gas and therefore what is in our interest? So India wants continuous supply of oil and gas at maybe cheaper prices and it would like to hedge against any global risk. So what better can you do than to have a relationship with the leader of the cartel. So if there is economic integration between India and Saudi Arabia, what can we get? All these key demands and this ensures that India is energy secure and it shock proofs shock proofing in terms of any global conflict how by having long term purchase agreements of large volumes at maybe some median prices which does not affect us in terms of the key issue of inflation so today itself oil is at 90 dollars per barrel so how does it affect our day-to-day -day life is directly through food and energy inflation. So we are looking to have a supply chain and how do you create a supply chain by going for mutual benefit. So 50 billion dollars of fund from Saudi Arabia then to create what a refinery. Now naturally oil into this refinery will come from Saudi Arabia and a partnership of this profit will be taken back to Saudi Arabia. So it creates a supply chain. So India and South Arabia, Saudi Arabia will both have interest in such projects and that is why they talk about the 50 billion dollar west coast refinery project and its capacity will be 60 million tons of refinery come petrochemical complex. Similar complex is there of Reliance in Jamnagar. Now, it also identified that energy, defense, semiconductor and space are key areas for intensified cooperation. And this, the world has seen pre-G20 meet in the Bharat Mandapam that India has successfully launched the Chandrayaan 3. So it builds a lot of social capital as well as diplomatic capital to engage in all these high technology sectors. Then the idea to diversify. Now diversification is in interest of India as well as Saudi Arabia. India wants to diversify out of oil. It wants to be less dependent on oil and gas and that too on oil and gas imports. But whatever limited amount that it will import for the next let's say two to three decades it wants assurance of supply it wants that the supply chain should not break down in cases of these global shocks which the world saw in terms of covid post covid and russia ukraine war where energy was weaponized and weaponization of energy became a crisis for western european countries now so diversification of current relationship from a hydrocarbon centric to a comprehensive energy partnership as well as in the areas of security. Why? Because India is a strong votary of anti-terrorism based cooperation. 
so globally india is pushing for a comprehensive agreement on the definition of terrorism so it wants to engage not only in terms of let's say fdis energy but also in terms of security architecture now the idea of india middle east europe economic corridor is also of significance why because china called for a unilateral 400 billion dollar investment into iran and we all know that iran is facing sanctions from the west now in the presence of the west and with the support of the western countries which was earlier named pgii we have launched a economic corridor so this is nothing but again a infrastructure project of connectivity but it will rival that of belt and road now more will be seen in due time other pacts were also signed related to cooperation in areas including digitization and investment and more particularly to use of digital public infrastructure which we discussed in g20 a good example is the upi architecture now let's look at the second article so lateral entry so let's write some names dr raguram rajan nandan nilekani arvind pangadia arvind subramanyam so what is common between these names so these are public functionaries all gui officials at certain time who were not belonging to any services whether it is ias ips etc so they they came from the private sector so these are the examples of a lateral entrant now let's understand why do we need later entry and what is later entry and why this is in news so the government is looking to appoint later entrants in various bodies like sebi rbi tri etc that is why it is come to news now why do we need later entry so let's take an example let's say in this organization there are multiple people and all are looking for social mobility so all of them will compete and few of them may rise to the helm of affairs to the top but let's say another person has already arrived in the market okay now someone opens a new company and they want some talent so either they can again create a talent pool train them or they can directly hire the trained people so it is easy to get trained people you just have to pay the money on the other hand the most difficult process is to train these individuals now what happens in the government is that multiple people are selected at the age of let's say 23 to let's say 35 just a number and these people are gradually trained to various levels to finally become a secretary in a ministry right on the other hand let's say these are private companies and here multiple people are working at the helm of affairs heading different departments so it is much easier for the government to pick the already proven talent and to give them let's say positions of joint secretary why because they have proved their credibility and there is lack of time to hone the talent for 20 years 15 years like that so what is later entry so we are basically going for skilled individuals and directly bringing them to helm of affairs 
वाय टू कट टाइम टू ट्रेन एज वेल एज टू गेट दी एक्सपर्टीज नाउ इन केस ऑफ गवर्नमेंट हाउ लिटरल एंट्री हेल्प्स सो वॉट आर दी एडवांटेजेस सो स्पेशलाइज नॉलेज लेट से लेट से सम स्टूडेंट्स हु वेंट टू आई आई टी दे स्टार्टेड वर्किंग इन कंसल्टिंग कंपनीज लेट से बी सी जी ऑनेस्ट यंग लेट से सम स्टूडेंट्स हु वेंट टू एस आर सी सी दे स्टार्टेड गोइंग फॉर चार्टर अकाउंटेंसी एंड दिस अगेन स्टार्टेड वर्किंग विथ ऑर्नेस्ट एंड यंग नाउ दीज पीपल आर वर्किंग इन डिफरेंट पोर्टफोलियोज लेट से दे आर वर्किंग इन इक्विटीज एंड दे आर वर्किंग इन रिस्क एडवाइजरी नाउ गवर्नमेंट गोज टू क्रिएट आई एफ एस सी ए इन गिफ्ट सिटी गुजरात सो विल इट बी कंड्यूसिव फॉर आई एफ एस सी ए टू गो फॉर ऑलरेडी ट्रेंड पीपल और टू ब्रिंग सिविल सर्वेंट्स हु आर नॉट एट ऑल ट्रेंड इन दीज डोमेन्स ऑफ स्पेशलाइज फाइनेंस एंड देन टू ट्रेन देम और टू टीच देम ऑल अबाउट फाइनेंस और लेट से इक्विटीज और लेट से रिस्क एडवाइजरी इंश्योरेंस री एश्योरेंस एक्चुरियल सर्विसेस सो इट इज वेरी डिफिकल्ट टास्क सो वेन एवर वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट एनी स्पेशलाइजेशन एनी लेवल ऑफ स्पेशलाइजेशन लेट से वी आर लुकिंग फॉर सम वन इन दी पैटेंट ऑफिस सो वी वुड रिक्वायर पीपल हु आर इन टेक्नोलॉजी सेक्टर्स और आर वर्किंग इन दी सेक्टर इट सेल्फ सो लेट से पैटेंट अटोर्नीज दम सेल्फ सो इधर ऑफ दी टू कैन बी पिक्ड अप बट लेट से आई हैव गॉन फॉर आई हैव गॉन एंड चार्टर अकाउंटेंसी सो कैन आई बिकम अ पैटर्न टटोन सो इन यूजल केसेस आई कैनॉट बट लेट्स टेक द एग्जाम्पल इन गवर्नमेंट लेट्स ए चार्टर अकाउंटेंट क्लियर्स दी सिविल सर्विसेज एग्जाम एंड बिकम्स एन आई एस ऑफिसर पोस्ट ट्रेनिंग ही कैन डायरेक्टली हेड द the entire patent office so what is happening so now this person will have to take all the knowledge about this sector and in a very minimal time but let's say this is a new department in itself let's say this is a new body in itself so would you wait for people to get trained or will you just get the trained people so it is about your requirement so you get specialized knowledge you get competence you save time in terms of training as well as you save resources in in, in terms of training now in the age of let's say data in the age of let's say ai where people are learning coding while they are schooling so can we wait and can we slow down the governance can we slow down the governance till let's say i learn how to let's say code so we cannot so individuals are not important why because the idea of government is to deliver public good and if you are delivering public good it should be timely delivery because delayed delivery is of no use therefore if the requirement is there immediate requirement is there then specialized knowledge is required then filling personal gap and this is the classic example that we saw so let's say we require 500 joint secretaries but here the requirement is that we need at least 12 doctors as joint secretaries but let's say i have more than 1200 applicants for this position but i have only 3 doctors so this leads to a skill mismatch 
and some departments and majority of the departments over the period of time they will require specialist so when we are talking about let's say decision making process as we are working at the bottom ranks as we are moving from block to the top so what is happening individual specialization is coming and here it is a generalist role now over the period of time what is happening that this process will take let's say 20 to 30 years but let's say there is a new department outside the government a regulatory authority or a society which requires a person who has worked in social defense so how can you give this 20 25 years of training to a civil servant in let's say six months and then offer the position of let's say uh, social defense so <clears throat> rapidly changing dynamics requires specialized knowledge and for filling personal gap these specialized knowledge individuals they are laterally hired then the issues of red tapeism the issues of excessive adherence to rules so to ro create roadblocks and to create red tapes rather than red carpets and going by the traditional Weberian model of bureaucracy. Then this also brings new perspectives and values of economy, efficiency and effectiveness. Now over the period of time what are we looking at? We are looking at a trend where let's say this was the 1950s. So here everything was being done by government. And gradually over the period of time, what is happening that the space for government or government operating is business is gradually shrinking and any entrepreneurial activity is taken up by private sector. And this has happened exponentially post liberalization. So what is the new norm? The new norm is that the IT minister will sit with all the industry leaders and the startup founders and he will look at some issues that they are facing then draft rules will be taken up and it will be open for feedback so more and more consultancy oriented work is being done so that at a later point of time there are no issues so rather than acting as a regulator government is now acting as a facilitator so everyone is trying to help for businesses to grow for startups to grow for people to do well to innovate to generate wealth so <clears throat> in participatory governance you require the government of india to be extremely friendly to private sector to let's say civil society organizations to ngos and most importantly to people so it is about collaborative approach it is about participative approach we cannot just go for a top-down approach anymore right so this requires free flow free flow of talent and skill so like when we trade with a country what happens there is free flow of goods services knowledge people similarly there must be free flow from government to private sector and private sector to government so that should be available so that we can have best use of talent. Now let's look at the issues. So one criticism is that whatever you want as expertise can be outsourced. So naturally government is seeking the help of Ernest and Young, BCG, KPMG. So consulting companies are usually used Bain and Co. So they will be used multiple times for making decisions or wherever they lack expertise, where they, wherever they think that better inputs can be bought. Good examples is in urban planning. Lots of inputs are bought in. Then the people who are coming here, they have no experience in government. So they have not gone to blocks. They have not gone to the collectorates or the districts and they do not know any issue at the grassroots level. So what will again happen? 
that even if they are expert in the private sector, they might not be experts in terms of the governance and what the needs of people are. Why? Because they lack connect from the people. Then the ideas of profit motive. So suddenly, let's say someone is making 3.5 crore and then getting a bonus of 2 crores. Suddenly that person will come to government at a salary of 1 lakh rupees or let's say 3 lakh rupees. So what is the intention? Maybe some public service? What else? So usually what happens, this can create issues of conflict of interest. Why? Because you had a profit motive from day one and suddenly the way you operate. So the operation of let's say a business and the government is extremely different. Why? This is for benefit of people and this is, sorry, this is for the benefit of people and the business is for wealth generation for its shareholders, stakeholders, right? So certainly a person cannot make that switch. And naturally conflict of interest may arise. Why? Because now I am working for the government, but I have my circle in the private sector itself. And so naturally there'll be, there can be so many misuse of these positions. So there can be potential problems in this conflict of interest. Now, what is the way forward? So multiple committees are looking at these issues. So the first ARC itself, it pointed out in back in 1965 that there is need for specialization. So there is reforms, the, the requirement of reforms in civil services, that is a no brainer. That has already been agreed by all the committees. But the specialization was highlighted back in 1965 only. Then Nath committee in 2003, Kota committee, they all called for more specialized recruitment rather than generalized recruitment. Why? Because the human resource management becomes poorer. So the human resource management is poor. Why? So a doctor heading, let's say defense estates and an engineer handling the health ministry. And this might seem as erroneous, but let's say not the secretary, but at least the joint secretary. Not even the joint secretary then, maybe a deputy secretary, an assistant secretary, but the skill mismatch is there. So scientific human resource management is missing and that is what the requirement is. Then going for objective criteria, whenever we are looking for these lateral entrants and relaxing the age barrier so that even young people can, can get in who have done, let's say good internships throughout their, let's say colleges. Then going for transparent power process so that the position is not diluted. And in this, UPC has a crucial role to play so that the transparency and objectivity of the process of recruitment is maintained. And then regular training. And this training must also include a local level training. Because given that, Let's say someone is working for the private sector and wants to transition into the government sector. There must be intensive tra training and more particularly at the grassroots level so that the person, the individual can understand these issues. But the committees have clearly stipulated that we need a specialization and the second ARC directly called for lateral entry. And that is why it can be a direct means question from this issue. The third article is about a quiet revolution in Jharkhand district as women learn to read and write. And this is from Dumka in Jharkhand. So it is a case study sort of, but it is related to the aspirational district program. So now un let's understand the backdrop. Why do we need such programs? So <clears throat> India, faces a lot of divides. Let's take some examples. Let's say rural, urban. Let's say, 
टेक्नोलॉजिकल डिवाइड डिजिटल हैव एंड हैव नॉट राइट सो मल्टीपल डिवाइड आर देर देन वी सी दैट देर इज इकोनॉमिक डिस्पैरिटी लेट्स टेक एन एग्जाम्पल सो वी नो दैट द ऑक्सफैम रिपोर्ट comes on inequality but when inequality it, it can be seen in space so it is called spatial inequality or disparity so let's say this is my state in the state here all the rich people live and for the rest of areas are starved so this is a typical example of inequality which can be clearly seen in space and this we can very well identify across india so what kind of disparities do we face in india so let's say state versus state example let's say punjab versus assam and we can take the best example in terms of agriculture then within state let's say konkan versus marathwada then regional also let's say coastal india versus the northern plains so these are clear divides in terms of economics which can be seen in space so concentration of economic opportunities in a particular space that is why you need intervention now can i say this disparity will also be present at a district level so if this is a state let's say four districts are developed why because these three districts is part of a industrial corridor and this one district is the capital so let's take the example of jharkhand in jharkhand you have cities like ranchi capital and you have tata nagar or jamshedpur but what about gumla what about other regions of jharkhand mining belts of jharkhand so they are suffering from socio economic disparities and therefore we need intervention and that is why the aspirational district program was launched in 2018 then we must have read about these keywords like bimaru states or we have seen the issue of let's say more than 90% urbanization in regions of ncr versus 20% urbanization in let's say bihar then we have also looked at issues where there is migration from poor districts of india to top cities of india so this is a term that we call as leap frogging migration so i want to directly rather than climbing the steps i want to directly migrate to delhi from let's say dhanbad so from dhanbad in jharkhand i directly want to go to delhi for better economic opportunity and i do not wish to go to lucknow or prayagraj or varanasi i want to go to either mumbai or delhi ncr or gurugram etc so that is leap frogging migration and that is why we need to distribute development in space and that is the wisdom of the aspirational district program now let's understand because this again can be a direct question both in your prelims as well as your mains or we can use this as a solution to issues like hunger malnutrition poverty or any kind of 
digital divides any kind of haves and have nots so this is a good content for all those types of questions now <clears throat> launched in 2018 and it is to address the developmental challenges faced by the districts now it works on this 3c model so convergence collaboration and competition what do you mean by convergence so convergence of let's say the state center and the local authorities to provide a single service let's say health so there must be no duplication whenever there is duplication what happens let's say you and i both have the same responsibility so it can happen that both of us will do the work or either of an uh, either of us will do the work or none of us will do the work but there will always be blame shifting if there is any problem so I'll say you have done wrongly and you will say I have done wrongly. And that is why you need convergence at, at what? The grassroots level. So immaterial of which party you are from, which political party is there in any state or not. The convergence must be there between all public functionaries of center state and the local authorities. Then the issue of collaboration. So it entails cooperation between center state level Prabhari officers and district collectors to ensure effective implementation and competition. Why competition? Because let's say there are these 112 districts and I create this monthly dashboard. Monthly, there is a competition And I have a dashboard where the top 10 are listed with the name of the officer who have gone for such reforms. So it generates a feeling of competition between whom? Between the district and the best district of the state as well as the district with the best district of India. So the idea is to become the best aspirational district. So fostering healthy competition along with cooperation. The ranking is based upon key performance indicators. And these are 49 in number. And these KPIs, they are built in in a ratio. And so these five points are extremely important for you to remember. So three three approach and these five keywords. So health and nutrition, education, agriculture, financial inclusion and skill development and infrastructure. So these five sub components will be the top priority. And whenever we start going to any district as aspirational district, we first go to target the low hanging fruits. Let's say by building wells using Manrega, I can directly solve the local water crisis or by making two ponds only, I can solve this issue. So these are low hanging fruits. But let's say we are targeting malnutrition. It will take some time, right? So parallelly, all the works will go on. But first, there will be target on the low hanging fruits and the aspirational district program is tied to India's SDG aspirations, the 17 SDGs of United Nations. So they are linked to these SDGs and Niti Aayog also releases a SDG dashboard. So ADP aspirational district program is a pet project of Niti Aayog. Right? Now, what are the challenges? So, budgetary constraints. Let's say I start five new initiatives and they are running beautifully. But if I discontinue the money or if there is change in government, so I completely dismantle the project, then what happens? Then there is lack of continuity. So rather than very good projects, some medium level projects with continuity are more important for governance. Then coordination challenges. And this happens because of politicization 
and due to let's say the silo mentality which is there let's say between state and center officers as well as between state and state officers in terms of various departments so this silo mentality lack of training to work in convergence then the issue of data quality so whether the data is updated or whether the data is integrated and this kpi only looks at the quantity aspects so let's say i have distributed i have distributed 100 pens and 100 books and 100 notebooks and i have created one digital board and i have here got some recorded lectures and i have provided all this infrastructure to all the 100 students of the school so can i say all of them will be literate so quantity is one thing and quality is another thing so still the issues of quality of education is pointed out by reports like asar despite having good indicators in the kpis now what is the way forward so we need to work also on the quality in terms of the dashboard that we have then the sustainability of these projects because these interventions can be very localized so let's say in a district the district collector goes for a drinking water campaign in another district the district collector is going for let's say sanitation why because these are the primary issues so unique issues of unique regions now what happens after five years on what happens about the best practices that are already built in will these best practices be continued so most important issue is sustainability but the project has been one of the most successful projects in terms of changes in quality of life and that is also visible in the article why because in dumka the administration was working on literacy of women so they were working in terms of on women who could not read or write and while looking at literacy they were also given training of digital literacy now what is the way forward so the aspirational district program has done tremendously well so that now it can be launched at block levels and more micro levels let's say we are looking at a belt which is affected by left wing extremism and there are three districts now let's say only this region of the district is affected by left wing extremism so micro region approach has to be adopted and also the aspirational district program must also move to urban areas which are facing similar constraints like towns which can become the next cities or bigger towns in the future to come let's look at try now what is a regulator so if there is any sector of economy let's say the telecom sector and there are multiple players telecom players there needs to be an oversight so in this case for the telecom industry try is the regulator which gives the oversight now established in 1997 and through an act of the parliament so try becomes a statutory body and this these small facts can be used in prelims exam by saying that trai is a statutory body an executive body etc etc so such options are usually made so the objective is to foster growth of telecommunication regulate telecom services setting tariffs why so as to prevent exploitation of consumers then fair and transparent policy environment promoting competition why because there must not be any abuse of dominance and there should not be any tariff wars to hit each other to destroy the competition then the tribe comprises of a chairperson and the government is mooting that this chairperson can be a lateral entrant who can be an industry expert 
rather than a typical civil servant. So a chairperson, two full-time members and two part-time members appointed by GOI. Then members can serve a three-year term or until they reach 65 years of age. Now what are the functions? So they, they provide new service providers. They are looking at license revocation. They are looking at competition, promotion, service quality standards. So quality of service and officially notifies telecommunication service rates. So these are the primary functions. Now they have the power to request information from all the telecom service providers, TSPs and appoint inquiry officers, inspect documents and issue necessary directions. However, the recommendations of TRI are not at all binding on the government of India and they are having mere persuasive value. The government can very well create committees and try and ask for papers, opinions, but it is totally the prerogative of the executive to finally agree to the recommendations of try. Now, let's look at the Nifty. So, Nifty nudges 20,000 mark, Sensex gains 528 points. Why this is important? And what is Nifty? So, it is an index of the financial market and it has been created by NSC. Now, when I say Nifty, usually it means Nifty 50. So, top 50 companies of India. Let's say I want to invest 100 rupees in Nifty 50. That simply means that I want to invest 100 rupees in top top 50 companies of India. But there are other indices also. Nifty 100, Nifty 200, 250, 500. These numbers simply tell you that this is the number of companies. So 200 is 200 companies, 100 is 100 companies. So these are the Nifty indices. Then there are sectoral indices also like Nifty IT, Nifty PSU Bank. So these are sectoral indices. Now, Nifty has touched an all-time high of 20,000 mark. And this too happens during this time. Now, why, why it has happened? So very strong economic growth prospects for next two to three decades to become the third largest economy of the world. Then naturally robust domestic flows. Why? Because of savings as well as the monthly mutual fund flow. So whenever we see the ads that mutual fund sahi hai or invest through mutual funds. So these are essentially instruments where you or us as investors do not think about where to invest. We rather just give a sum of money and the mutual fund company. Let's take the example of ICICI security. So they will invest in behalf of us and then we can redeem and get the money back. Then there are domestic institutional investors. The biggest investor of India is the president of India. Approximately having 16 lakh crores worth of equities. Then what else? So <coughs> India recently saw success in space. Then it saw success in diplomacy. When you look at G20 with the Delhi Declaration. Then it was able to steer away from these global headwinds. When you talk about two years of COVID, then post-COVID recovery, then Russia-Ukraine issue, then NPA issues due to COVID, then FII selling. So massive selling of foreign institutional investors during COVID and after, after COVID, during Russia-Ukraine war. So massive foreign institutional investors or as much as 2 lakh crore were withdrawn from the Indian markets. And simultaneously, oil shocks and oil prices touching $100 per barrel. But still, India was able to steer away from all these challenges and was and has been successfully steering its economy while also delivering deliverables like success in space as well as in diplomacy. So naturally, Nifty has touched an all-time high on the promise of 
Indian economy. And investors, both foreign, domestic, as well as individual investors, retail investors and domestic funds, they have all invested to bring this psychological number. So it's a great feat. Thank you so much. I hope it helped.